Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we can choose the number of components uh, in Parafac. And as usual, let us use the amino acid data set. Um, and let's build a model. Let's take three components. And before actually looking into the number of components, let's just go through this window that appears uh, when we fit the Parafag model. So let me just shortly explain all the different windows that we have here. The first one is the loadings. Actually, this blue text, if I click it, will tell me that it is a line plot of the loadings. And that I can get a nicer view by uh, pressing the white part, right-clicking like this. So here I can get a nice overview of all the details, including names, etc. Okay, here we have more or less the same thing. It's just a scatter plot, and it says F1.2. Well, that's because it's a scatter plot of factor 1 and 2 in mode 1. So it is the, gre the green versus the blue one. Just an ordinary scatter plot, in this case, a score plot of score 1 versus score 2. If we get in doubt about the meaning of these things, we can just go down here and there will be a short explanation of what the different things uh, mean. F is factor, uh, M is mode, etc. Now I can change this by just clicking on the red one. Now it's a score plot of component 1 versus 3, 2 versus 3, etc. So I can go through the different ones. And again, like in this plot, I can just click in the white part to get a scatter plot of mode 2. Well, that's a little bit confusing. We're not really used to that, seeing continuous loadings like these plotted against each other, but it's actually quite helpful. Uh, once you get used to it, uh, you can get information about where the peaks are positioned, etc. Um, but it's a little bit unusual. But this is a scatter plot. This is a line plot. So they're basically showing the same thing in two different ways. Down here, we have an influence plot. If we right click, we can see that it's just the sum squared residuals versus the hotelings T squared. So this is what we can use for detecting outliers, for example. If we go to the next one, this is the variation per component. And again, if we right click, we get a little bit more information. It's a little bit strange that we have two bars for every component. But the thing is that the components in Parafag are not orthogonal. And that means the variances are not additive. Now the blue line shows you the variance, the total variation of component 1. But this one shows you the unique variation. So the variation which is not correlated to any of the other components. So this one is always going to be smaller than the blue one. The brown or whatever color that is. The brown one will always be smaller than the blue one. But we see here for this particular data set the difference is very, very small. Actually, you can s often see that when the difference is... Actually, when you get a model which is not nice, so a model which is not correct, maybe has too many components, you will typically see a huge difference between some of these. So you indirectly you can take that as an indication that there is a problem with the model. It's not really a proof or anything, but it, it's an indication. This whole column here has to do with residuals. Now the residuals is just a freeway array 5 by 201 by 61. It's the same size as my original data set. It's the data minus the model of the data. Okay. So let me actually skip that for now and just show you here. Here's the model 
of sample one. If I click here, I get the raw data. Model, the raw data. If I subtract the model from the data, I get the residuals. And that's what we see down here. So this is the residual landscape of sample one. I can press here and see the same for sample two. And here we have the residuals of sample two. So we have five of these landscapes. So five by 201 by 61 uh, residuals. And you see that when we look at the raw residuals here, we can see structure. And this particular structure is related to scattering, which I'm not going to talk about here. This is a fluorescence specific problem. But we see that we do have some scattering uh, in the residuals. And we actually appreciate that these are in the residuals because they're not really containing any chemical information. Now, the, these are the residuals I get from my Parafact model. And I can, I can visualize them in all kinds of ways. For example, I can take all the 5 by 200 by 61 residuals and plot in a normal probability plot to check if they are normally distributed. Or I can do histograms like here. Or I can square all of these and sum them for sample free. And that will give me this number here. Or I could square all of them for sample 4, and that would give me this number. So in this way, I can see if maybe one of the samples would have an unusually high sum squared residual variation. I can also do the same for the emission. And I can see that my residual variation is much higher here than it is here in the high emissions. Well, basically, that's just because there's not much going on in the high and low regions. So we only get residuals in the areas where we have chemistry going on, you can say. So this is actually not too unusual. If we go to the excitation, though, you see that we have something which is a little bit strange. We have one particular... Sorry. One particular excitation that has an unusually high um, um, residual. And we kind of expect some, some sort of smoothness here. Uh, but this one breaks it. So apparently there must be something wrong with the instrument. If, if I go to the excitation loading, see, I can actually... Well, it's very difficult to see. Let me expand this. You might be able to see a little bump here, which is caused or related to this residual here. So it does affect the model, but only very, very little. So, But in reality, we should probably exclude this particular uh, excitation from our model. And this is actually a nice illustration of how useful this interface is. It doesn't give us too much information or details on each plot, but it allows us to very easily go through a number of different plots and get a quick overview of a data set, and that's very uh, convenient. Now the last plot we miss here is the core consistency plot. So let me tell you uh, about the core consistency plot. <coughs> what it shows us, let me expand it, is actually this core array that we talked about in the previous movie. This is a free component model. So the core array is free by free by free. So it has 27 elements. For a parafact model, this core array would be a super diagonal of ones. So it would have three ones for component one, two, and three. So a super diagonal of ones. And all the remaining 24 elements, 27 minus three, would be zero. So we hope that when we fit the Parafact model and calculate the actual core, it looks like this uh, free ones and then a lot of zeros. The blue line is the ideal super diagonal of ones. The green are the estimated elements. And the red ones are the estimated elements. The green ones should be zero and the red ones should be one. And we can see that they follow pretty close, the blue line. And that's why the core consistency is 100. So this is a nice model. 
The only last thing I have to mention in this window is this number up here. It's just the uh, variance explained uh, in percentages. But for now, let's focus on the core consistency. Let me do a two-component model and we'll see what the core consistency is. This is a two-component model, and you can see that it also has a high core consistency. And in general, we always expect high con uh, core consistencies, not per definition, but we expect that, even with too few components. We do see that the percentage variance explained is much lower now, 86.7%, uh, whereas it was 99 point something before. And we also see the residuals have a lot of structured information because we are really not describing all the variation in our data very well because we know we need free components. Okay, now let me do five components for example. This would be too many components. So what we expect is, well, first of all, we expect that it takes somewhat longer to estimate. And then we expect that the core consistency uh, might be low uh, when we take too many components. Now, in fact, it may be that it takes so long to estimate this model that we don't want to wait for that. Um, so what we can do is that we can actually just stop the model where it's at right now. It's not really converged at all, so it's not really going to be the model. But for now, we can just pretend, uh, but we really should not trust this. It's not really the model. It's just some interim estimate uh, along the way. But just to save some time, let me stop. And seems to be a warning here. Yeah, I got a warning that the model didn't converge. So we have to be careful. But let's just pretend for now that the model did converge. And let me take a look here. Now you see the core consistency looks absolutely terrible. I have five non-zero ones because I have five component models. So my core array is five by five by five. And it should be a super diagonal of ones, five ones. But it really isn't. It's way off this blue line, the blue ideal, it's really way off. And that's why we get a very low core consistency, indicating that this model is not uh, a very nice model. Of course, the fit is nice because we use many components, but it's not an adequate model as judged from the core consistency. Now, we shouldn't only base our analysis on consistency, so we should also look at uh, what the model is doing. But here it also looks like the spectral loadings don't look very uh, chemical. Well, just to show you some in-between results, let me build a Parafact model using four components. So four components should also be too many components. But what you will see is that the core consistency is actually high on this one, which is counterintuitive maybe. Here you see that the core consistency seems to be quite high. 92 is very high. So as judged from the core consistency, this is a suitable model. So what's wrong here? Or is anything wrong? Well. If we take a look here, if you look at these four components, you actually see that the three main ones are very similar to what they were before. And there's a new one, which doesn't really look like a fluorescent spectrum. It's a little bit too narrow for that. And actually, maybe it seems like it is something trying to describe the scattering somehow. 
And also in the excitation, it looks kind of strange uh, and difficult to interpret. Well, and in the score plot, we see that this fourth component has a very, very low variance, small score values. And you also see that here, the fourth component is explaining very little. Somehow this fourth component is trying to explain some of the non-trilinear variation. It's not doing a very good job at it, because we still see a lot of this scattering here. But it's trying to do that, and only succeeding very little. It has very low uh, score values, very little variance explained. And it does seem to be reflecting some of the scattering and it might even be consistent from a perfect point of view which is why we get a high core consistency but really we don't like that component but the solution here is well we could actually use this four component model the free and the four component model give more or less the same interpretation because it's only these three major ones that are big so we could use both of them but the real solution here would probably be to handle the scattering, this Rayleigh scattering, uh, in a better way. But that's not really, uh, uh, that's beyond what we are trying to do here. Uh, but from a fluorescence point of view, that's what we would want to do, handle the Rayleigh scattering. Now let me just show you one final thing. Um, and that is that this core consistency plot will look a little bit funny if you take more components than one of the dimensions. I'll do a seven component model now. And we only have five components in uh, the sample mode. So we have more components than samples. And it's, it's just a mathematical uh, issue that the core consistency problem is going to be phrased a little bit differently. And that will give you an unusual, unusually looking um, core consistency plot. Let me just stop this. We don't really have a solution, but let's pretend. Now the blue line is not just zeros and ones anymore. Let me show you. Here we are. I'm not really going to explain this in detail, but it's just for you to know that this is not a problem. This Parafact model was a seven component model, so we expect that there should be a seven by seven by seven uh, core array, so seven ones. But mathematically, we have to redefine it when one of the modes is uh, smaller than the number of components, and the core array turns into something quite uh, different from this super diagonal. But the way to interpret this is still the same. We expect the red dots on the non-zero part of the blue line, and we expect the green dots on the, the zero part. So it's just a little artifact that we have to deal with. In the original paper about core consistency, you can read about how this uh, uh, is handled. But the interpretation is still that a value close to 100 is nice, and towards zero, uh, the opposite.